Portugal is considered by many historians to be the first world superpower. But this raises the question, how did such a small country with such a tiny population become so powerful in the 15th century? Well, there's not a straight answer to this question, but there are a group of factors that greatly contributed to it. First, there was the location, which is being located on the South Atlantic coast of Europe, near to the exit of the Mediterranean, was a clear strategic benefit, providing a good food supply and helped the development of an unrivaled knowledge of the Atlantic winds, weather and tides. Secondly, there was Portugal's ability to absorb new Christians. What do I mean by this? Well, as Jewish merchants and scholars were driven out of Spain after the Reconquista, they brought with them not only knowledge, but just plain manpower, and with this flow of people coming into the country to take refuge, there was a boost in the size of the Portuguese population. But these topics are not the main subject of this video. That will come later on the channel, so subscribe if you don't want to miss it. This video focuses on the third, and in my opinion more interesting factor which helped Portugal become so dominant at sea, which is their expertise in shipbuilding. You see, Portugal wasn't the only country with a great location. Along with England, France and Spain, these European nations are considered to be the main characters in the age of exploration. All of them bordered the Atlantic Ocean and had easy access to the sea, with many seaports and experienced sailors, which allowed these four nations to have the ability to explore further into the Atlantic while other European nations did not. But Portugal had something the others didn't have, experience in naval warfare and leading-edge technology in shipbuilding. Since the year 1180, the Portuguese navy had been constantly fighting the Muslims, trying to expel them out of the Iberian Peninsula with the famous Reconquista. So it's only natural that 300 years later, the country had one of the best navies in the world. And the Portuguese have one man to thank for that. Prince Henrique the Navigator. Henrique was responsible for kickstarting the age of exploration in Portugal, and consequently Europe. He started carrying out multiple expeditions to places around Portugal, such as Madeira and Azores, and although he never directly carried out any trips of his own, Henrique was vital in Portugal's earliest trips and for revolutionizing the way that these trips were recorded. He set up a school of navigation in 1419 and under his direction sailors perfected sailing techniques, navigational tools, designs for sails and different mapping techniques. For example, he is credited with being the first to require captains of ships to keep a record of their journeys. This was important because it allowed different explorers to combine their findings to build up a common knowledge base of discoveries. This navigation school of Sages studied and developed cosmography, astronomy, cartography and basically all sciences that helped navigators to sail further into the unknown. People from all over the world came into this institute to learn everything they could and bring the knowledge to their own countries. The institute can be thought as sort of the NASA of its time. With his knowledge and good leadership from Prince Henrique, Portugal became the leading nation when it came to naval technology and know-how. Just to give you some context, in the first half of the 16th century, while Indian spices made Portugal the richest country in the world, the country still did not have a large army, but it had a superior navy than any other country. As maritime exploration in Portugal was state-owned, the Portuguese state had a fleet which, according to Oliveira Martins, reached a total of 400 large high-flying vessels. In comparison, England at the time had only 20 such ships. But Portugal still needed something to take them to the next level. I present to you the Caravela. Developed from the type of Portuguese fishing boat in the mid-15th century by order of the Prince Henrique, its main purpose was to explore along the West African coast and into the Atlantic Ocean, and it worked like a charm. The caravel proved to be highly maneuverable while at the same time being able to transport lots of goods and people. The main breakthrough of this ship was the fact that it could sail towards the wind. The caravel was a vehicle of choice for Columbus to reach America and Bartolomeu Dias to go around the southern tip of Africa and demonstrate to the world that the most effective route for trading with the east was in fact through open water. Then it came the Carax, or now in Portuguese. These were much taller and overall tougher ships, made to carry troops to the other side of the world, as well as provisions and cargo required for trading in the Indian Ocean. Vasco da Gama used carrots to reach India by sea for the first time in history, 
but the carracks used for exploration were much smaller than the ones used for carrying goods, seeing the exploration crew was much smaller and the objective was to be as fast as possible. This raised the problem though, although for the next 100 years after Vasco da Gama achievement, the East India trade was controlled by the Portuguese, the fact that Portugal began sending voyages every year to the East and started to become one of the richest countries in Europe brought a lot of attention. The smaller carracks started being targeted by pirates and other nations trying to get some of the goods acquired by the Portuguese. At first, the Portuguese installed cannons to their carracks, but it became evident that as the cargo became more and more valuable, the defense mechanisms were not enough to withstand the attacks from other ships, so something had to be done. England introduced a new ship, the Galleon, a larger and more seaworthy ship when compared to its predecessors in European navies. The Galleon was created to meet the new challenges of naval warfare, where the strategy of boarding an enemy vessel was replaced by blasting it out of the water using heavy cannons. It combined the best design features of the three types of ships, the galleys, the caravels and the caracks. That's exactly what Portugal needed. So they went to work and in 1534 they presented to the world the biggest, the strongest and the most powerful galleon the world had ever seen. But don't take my word for it. This was reported by Portuguese, Castilian and Italian observers at the time. The ship was something to behold. The San Juan Batista Galleon had 1000 tons of displacement and was able to carry 600 musketeers, 400 sword soldiers and 300 gunners. It's the beautiful ship I used on the thumbnail. But these stats weren't that impressive when compared to other galleons throughout Europe and it definitely wasn't the reason why it became so famous and got the nickname of Botafogo or in English Spitfire. No, the nickname came from the 366 cannons carried by the ship which would decimate any other boat to dare to face it. Portugal's maritime power in the 16th century was clearly unquestionable and it needed to be to control such a vast territory. But let's dive further into why this ship was so powerful and how did the other countries not simply copy the design and built a similar one? The simple answer is, they just couldn't. First, the cannons used were mostly made in Portugal, while other nations imported their cannons from India, which created a great distance between the producer and the user, and consequently, the relationship between them wasn't as tight as it was in Portugal. Because the Portuguese cannons only used the best bronze and material by order of the king, while others were more concerned with profitability, the Portuguese cannons were of a much higher quality and would very rarely burst, while the same couldn't be said about the cannons of other galleons. Then there was also the invention of hatches, openings in the hull of the ships that allowed firing from all angles. And adding to this, there was also the invention of charging the cannons from behind. This was revolutionary and the Portuguese galleon was now able to fire six times faster than the enemy seeing that they had to reload from the front. From then on, naval warfare would change forever. Before this breakthrough, the ships used to get rammed by the attacking force and soldiers would hop on board and fight the crew, but San Juan Batista Galleon removed that from the equation. Now, no other ship could even get close before sinking to the ocean and just watch the almighty Galleon fire its almost 400 cannons constantly, like it was in fact spitting fire. The Portuguese Galleon even started to be hired by other countries, with the famous instance of when Charles V of Spain asked for help from the King of Portugal and with the São João Batista Galleon they were able to finally conquer Tunis and almost capture the famous pirate Redbeard. The conquest of Tunis happened in 1535, when the city, then under control of the Ottoman Empire, was finally attacked by the Spanish forces. It is reported that the São João Batista Galleon was able to break the chains at the entrance of the port of the city on only its second try and unleash hell on the city port, being the main reason why the attack was so successful and 20,000 Christian slaves were finally released. The achievements of this garden were such that the member of the crew responsible for its artillery, named João de Souza Pereira, became famous and also got the nickname Botafogo, which he later included in his family name, and when he went to live in the Portuguese colony of Brazil, to fight against the French and the local Indians, the Portuguese crown granted him some lands near the newly found city of Rio de Janeiro as a reward. Even today in some places of China near Macau there is an old legend about the mighty Botafogo ship, 
which will return from the deep sea to revenge the Portuguese traders murdered by the Chinese emperor. This galleon also gave the name to the famous Brazilian football club Botafogo, which is the club with more fans in the world. If you'd like to know the story of the first Roman to have ever seen ancient China, please press this video. Thanks for watching. Obrigado.